This is Polyamory Weekly, tales from the front of responsible non-monogamy from a pansexual, kink-friendly point of view. A warning for our under-18 listeners, this is an adult-oriented podcast about really lascivious things like communication and honesty in relationships. If you're under 18 and looking for upfront advice and answers to questions about sex, please visit scarletteen.com. This is Polyamory Weekly, episode 522 for June 22nd, 2017. Coming up on today's show. I feel displaced by my new metamor. That's coming up on today's show. Hello, everyone. I'm your host, Minx, and today in the co-host chair we have... Lusty Guy, happy and lucky to be here as always, even if I am, in fact, dying! Melting. Melting. Oh my God, it's hot. (laughs) It's over 80 degrees in Seattle. We're all dying. You know, Seattle pretty much does nothing but bitch and moan as soon as it snows or it gets hotter than 80 degrees. So I'm I'm, I'm doing my part. To be fair, we're coming up on 90. And despite the fact that I pay more each month in rent for my apartment than I did for my first car, there is no air conditioning here. And we have to close the windows in order to record... Because I live on a busy street. Did your car, your first car, have air conditioning? Uh, well, yeah, it was in Texas. Of course my first car had air conditioning. Wow, my first car didn't have air conditioning. Well, you really can't sell a car in Texas without air conditioning. It's pretty much impossible. So we have um, iced water. Yay. And um, I have an ice pack between my naked thighs. And mine's going all over, man. I'm not a one-place kind of guy. It's behind <laughs> the neck. It's on the elbows. It's all over. And to put Lusty Guy in a better mood, I am also podcasting naked, except that I am wearing an ice pack and earphones. (laughs) It's true. It's very cute. (laughs) Ah, Not the nipple. Yeah, look at that. Oh, this is going to be a fun one. (laughs) Okay. So we actually do have a topic to stop it. (laughs) We do have a topic today. um, Ice play. (laughs) There you go. Cold play. (laughs) Oh, not the terrible band, but the fun activity. Um, But we have a couple of announcements this week. Uh, First of all, we are going to be at Poly Dallas Millennium in just a few weeks in Dallas, Texas. so excited. Yes, and he's mostly excited because he's going to go hunting afterwards. Well, that's part of why I'm excited, but I'm also really excited to go down and hang out with Ruby and get a gander at some fantastic content. The, uh, The voyeur party that she's putting together looks to be really, really fun. And the show looks to be really educational and worthwhile for us in particular. Indeed. So excited about that, apart from the fact that I still have to write my keynote. Yeah, but you know it. Off. <laughs> also, if you listen to the last few episodes, you know that recently I uh, made a response video to one of my Bialik's uh, videos on how she didn't get open relationships. And because I'm fun employed and had time, I made a response video and post it on Facebook, where it currently has over 30,000 views. Well, according wow. to Facebook. Well, that's Facebook, though. I think those are more like impressions. I think if somebody scrolls past it in the feed, they count it as a view. I don't think that means somebody actually clicked and listened to it. I think you're right. I think yeah. you're right. One of the industrials I did once had like a quarter million views on Facebook in the first 48 hours. And I was like, oh, my God. There has been evidence that Facebook vastly inflates the view numbers. But I will say it was shared almost 300 times. Like the link, nice. like that post was shared almost 300 times, which is far beyond anything that I've ever posted. Um, but I also posted it on YouTube. But as you folks know, I don't really do much on my YouTube p- channel. I cross post my uh, the audio podcast as a vi- uh, as a video, but it's just you know the album art plus me talking, so it's not very exciting. Most of them only have like twenty plays, and then it did start getting several thousand plays on YouTube, which is uh, not a lot for other people, but is a lot for me. And then came the YouTube comments. <laughs> <laughs> which gave you an opportunity to learn how to use a new tool. Exactly. So most of the comments were positive, but at some point somebody must have linked or, you know, we got a couple of trolls. And this is when I discovered things too. I think it was Kid O'Connell on my Facebook said that you can 
set all your videos to moderate comments. And I'm like, well, I don't have to moderate every comment. But then I saw that YouTube has a tool where you can put in a list of bad words. And if anybody uses one of those bad words, it automatically goes to a moderation queue. But if somebody doesn't use those bad words, it's automatically posted. So polite trolls are okay. <laughs> trolls who do not use the word whore, slut, idiot, or stupid can post. <laughs> Just so you know. <laughs> so if you're going to be a troll, be creative. Yes. Well, that's the thing. If you're going to troll, if you do it in, in a civil and intelligent way without personal attacks or name calling, is fine. I'm okay with that. Yeah. So uh, that was a little lesson for me. Uh, what was the other announcement? Oh, yes. Uh, as I was going through my email, I discovered this lovely email from a country western artist named Susie Davis who has actually created and recorded a country western sort of pro polyamory ballad you gotta get the name of the band with her band it. tight her. pajamas what a great name <laughs> and i'll provide a link in the show notes where you can download you can pay to download the song itself if you want and i will actually be playing that song as the outro of this episode in its entirety i'll also provide a link to the music video for it which is just as cute and cheesy as the song is and for the record, on a day when I was admittedly grumpy and complaining about everything. When, <laughs> he when, is. Yeah, He's hot. Yeah, I'm hot. When Minx played that, I did, in fact, smile and laughed and said, oh, that's, that's cute. That's kind of funny. It's it cute. is cute. Yeah. Yeah. This week in Polly in the News, well, it's not really news, but it's more I finally found uh, the recording in the archives. <laughs> Well, so that's news. our friend and comic book shop owner, David, recorded his review of the book, The Secret History of Wonder Woman, because the uh, Wonder Woman movie came out recently and all of us good feminists went out to go see it, which was awesome. And it was fun. I loved it. It was fun. It was uh, My comment on the movie was, if all superhero movies were like this, I would watch them. But most of them aren't. So here is his review. Hello, Minx. Thank you for allowing me to submit this review of The Secret History of Wonder Woman by Jill Lepore. Wonder Woman, the birth control movement, kink, feminism, comics industry, and an unconventional family who created the comic are all subjects covered in Jill Lepore's work, The Secret History of Wonder Woman. As a cisgendered poly male and comic book store owner, I found this work very intriguing. William Moulton Marston, the creator of Wonder Woman, graduated from Harvard with a degree in psychology and law. Along the way, he worked with many early noted feminist professors and taught at Mount Holyoke. Along the way, he also married Elizabeth Holloway Marston, brought a student, Olive Byrne, to, into their home, and they intermittently shared their home with Marjorie Wilkes Huntley. The family is fascinating. Though Marston is credited as the creator of Wonder Woman, he wrote Wonder Woman as the embodiment of many feminist ideals of the time. It was also clearly a collaborative effort. The bracelets worn by Olive Byrne made their appearance on Wonder Woman's form. Elizabeth had a great deal of influence on the character. Even the, fam the children of the household made their appearances as family situations were written into the story ideas submitted by Marston. And this leads us to the family arrangements. Marston married Elizabeth Holloway. Several years later, he brought Olive Byrne into the family through what seems to have been an ultimatum to his wife, not something that would be supported by modern polyamorous. Rocky beginnings aside, Elizabeth and Olive seem to have been part of a generally happy family and, after the death of Marston in 1947, continued to live together until Olive died in 1986. Lepore recounts how Marston had children by both Olive and Elizabeth, and all the children lived together with their parents and were raised in the, in the same household. Marjorie Huntley was a frequent visitor to the home. It seems to have been a fairly chaotic and generally happy polycule. Elizabeth Holloway Marston was a talented editor and psychologist and polymath, and possibly the most brilliant member of the household. Olive Byrne was an accomplished writer whose mother went on a very publicized hunger strike in an effort to draw attention to the birth control movement. Her aunt was Margaret Sanger, who was key in that movement, as well as the feminist movement of the early 1990, uh, 1900s. Really, I mean 20th century, but, you know, 1900s is what I wrote. But the people are flawed and not perfect. The reason, of course, is that unlike the spangle-briefed 
female protagonist, Wonder Woman, they are, were real people. Marston spent most of his life promoting himself in a method that is questionable in that he sometimes misrepresented his accomplishments. Olive Byrne refused to allow her and William's children to know who their father was. Individual flaws are revealed without apology, an effort that ensures that we do not put any of them on pedestals, but regard them as the humans that they were. Marston, Holloway, Byrne, and Huntley were all part of a group of free love advocates who practiced love binding and dominant submission. These qualities made their way into early Wonder Woman comics. Such frequent representations gave ammunitions to those such as Frederick Wortham of the notorious work Seduction of the Innocent. The representations of the members of the household headed by Elizabeth, William, and Olive, and that they also included their four children and Marjorie Huntley, leads me to feel that they did form a polycule. They seem to have been happy for many years, but the stresses of staying closeted did have a cost. The children seem to have had many parental resources, but they did have to keep the family arrangement secret. Olive reportedly threatened to kill herself if Marston's parentage of his children was ever revealed to them, leading to confusion among some of the children regarding their fa who their father was, and pain to Marston that he could not tell them that he was indeed their father. At the end of their lives, Olive and Holloway, who had been inseparable for 64 years, were in the same hospital but not the same room. This seems sad to me. I would like to strongly recommend the reading of this book by comic book enthusiasts, as well as by historians of the feminist and birth control movements, and, of course, by people interested in non-monogamous households. The writing is very good, the story is tight, the people are treated as flawed but human individuals. Thank you very much. Now, Lusty Guy, you actually read that same book as well, yes? I did, and I really enjoyed the book. Um, it has all kinds of wonderful insights, and as that review uh, lets you know, it spans everything from suffragette movement and uh, uh, birth control all the way through the 1970s. And it's a fascinating story of a fascinating family. I would just add two little two little notes. I heard recently, and... Uh, uh, speech that Jill Rappaport gave where she relayed an anecdote of having met the son, one of the sons from, from the family and saying to him, you know, I'm, I'm terribly sorry that, that I have to ask you this, but I, but I do have to ask you this. What about, what about restraint and, and S and M and B and D did they, did they do? And she said that the son looked at her with a little bit of a twinkle in the eye and said, are you asking me if the ladies ever tied him up? And she was so <laughs> embarrassed that he was asking that way. And she was like, well, yeah, I, I am asking that. And he smiled and said, not that I ever saw. Well, not that he saw. Indeed. I but... thought that was a great answer. <laughs> and then finally, when I believe it was that same son, but it may have been a different one, died, his son, this would have been the grandson of the family that created uh, – um, Wonder Woman, wrote a wonderful uh, eulogy for his grandfather in which it mentioned the woman that he married and the woman who joined his life and never mentioned a divorce or separation. Mm -hmm. It didn't expressly say anything. I'm not telling you any conclusions. I don't know. But it looked like you could make an argument that the apple might not have fallen too far from the non-monogamous tree. <laughs> So while we're talking about Wonder Woman, while everybody's talking about Wonder Woman... It's a good movie. Any comments on the movie? Oh, you know, go see the movie. Go see the movie with a woman you care about. If you're not a woman, if you are a woman, go see the movie. You already know. You don't need me to tell you that. There, It's, it's very enjoyable. I do think in the long run, there are some conversations to be had about the treatment of some of the non-white characters... Mm. Um, and I think there's some conversations to be had about uh, some of the details of the uh, empowerment of women and the feminist critique of this movie. I'm not sure. I'm a cis guy. I'm not the one who's going to make the conclusions. But I predict, given a little bit of time when the euphoria of seeing this movie dies down, there'll be some criticisms of it that come from feminists um, and cisgendered women for some of these things that I'm talking about and maybe some other things. Or I could be completely wrong. And I will tell you my favorite part of the movie, although it does contain spoilers, so if you don't want to hear this, you probably want to fast forward about two minutes or so. So I watched the movie and loved it. And at the end of the movie, I said, oh, you know, what I really love most about the movie is that Wonder Woman and the male love interest Steve. didn't have sex. 
<laughs> oh, wait. Unless they had sex when I went to the bathroom. Did they have sex while I went to the bathroom? And, and then, I said, yeah, they yeah, had they sex had sex while you were in the bathroom. bathroom. Well, and, and what's funny is when I mention this to others, they say, well, it was kind of implied. You sort of see the after effects. It was, I, I think the conclusion is that, that, yes, they did, in fact, have sex. It, you, with the standard tropes of Hollywood, they had sex, right? They're mm. in a dark room. It's at night. They kiss. There's a close-up when they kiss. And then the next shot is them outside the black. room as the light goes out. Yeah. You know, so, yeah, it looks pretty much like they did. Yeah. Anyway, still a great movie, even though I suppose they actually had sex. I don't mind that they had sex. I mean, I, I it's fine. I understand the criticism. Yeah. Um, I do get it. But it also made sense. It was, it, since we're giving spoilers, right after her first battle or her second battle and uh, her first successful one, a really successful one. And I could see everybody's up and buzzed on life and there's an attraction to the two of them. And they're grownups and they're adults. And furthermore, she's not from a place or a culture where there's any reason not to have sex. Yeah. So it worked. It but- just would have been refreshing. It would have for once, but but that being said, mm, damn, he's cute. So can't really. (laughs) Chris Pine's a good looking man. (laughs) Yeah, he is, and he was good in that role. Our next news item is actually a news item versus poly pop culture, which I think is still relevant. This is that three men actually registered their polyamorous marriage in Colombia. It doesn't necessarily mean that they are legally married. What they actually did was swear a document saying that they are all together, a legal document and had it notarized, saying that they are all together in a relationship. So who knows what that actually means? There is a lot of information about this, including a photo of the actual document, as well as a super cute photo of these cute three gay boys. Look at that. (laughs) I love it. And, uh, and, you know, a lot of uh, additional press coverage. Uh, but again, it's not technically a legal marriage since that would be illegal. But it's something. It's something. And as always, Alan from Polly and the Media has got a great rundown, definitive sources. A lot of the coverage of this has been filled with a lot of hype. And uh, go check Alan's right out and page of it out to get the scoop. Our topic this week is about someone who might feel displaced by a new metamor. So this is from New Tapali, who writes in to say, I'm in my first non-monogamous relationship and have been dating my partner for a year and a half. My partner is expanding and doing some BDSM-related play with someone he openly intends to date and have a sexual relationship with. My concern is that he's adjusting our established weekly protocols to plan his play dates on our weekly phone chat, and that I'm being pushed aside to explore that new space. I'm having a hard time dealing with the emotions it brings when my partner casually says to me the day before our weekly chats that we'll have to chat a different day because he's playing with his new potential partner. Do I have the right to be upset, or are these feelings and emotions just out of whack due to being inexperienced with very poly situations? Well, that's an easy question. Yeah, it is an easy question. Yeah, you always have the right to feel how you feel. Yeah. That's that's not a problem. The question is, what do you do? Now, there are times, certainly, where one's feelings may be disproportional, right? And that's fine. That's what we call owning your shit. And then you we know. do. And, and we realize, okay, look, I'm entirely more angry than I should be here now or something. That's all good. But however you feel is fine. Yeah. If you have a standing date with somebody and express agreement that you're going to do something at a particular time and date, to have them cancel it without involving you in that cancellation would put anybody's nose out of joint. And in a repeated manner as well. Absolutely. Now, you know, if it were, again, one off and somebody calls and says, oh, there's this one time thing or I'm sick or something like that, that's different. But in particular, to have it done more than once and to have it done because they want to go play with someone new or speak to or interact with or whatever would gall anybody. It pisses me off. Yeah. I don't like it. No, I mean, we have plans. On the other hand, if my partner came to me, you know, a couple days in advance and said, hey, the only time this new person I'm seeing is available is that night. Can we do a workaround and maybe even offer to make it up to me somehow or buy me a drink or something? Well, sure, that's another matter. But to, to presume that I will acquiesce without a discussion and involving me, that's going to make anybody upset. 
Yeah, yeah. And as you say, it's a matter of um, it's a matter of respect, I think. Uh, one of the things I really appreciate about L is that, you know, my schedule can be kind of crazy and uh, I, I tend to go out and do a lot of things and try to do way too much and, and which leads to some date night shuffling and, and whatnot. And then you and I are often going out of town to speak at events, which means I'm taking away her husband for, you know, three or more days. But, you know, we do it respectfully. You know, we put it on the calendar and make sure everything's okay. We don't just put it on the calendar and have it magically appear, right? We, right. We do put it on a shared Google calendar, but we always talk about it. And, you know, if it appears that there's even a hint of hurt feelings, and even with not, I think you and I both work kind of hard to show appreciation. Like, I'll bring her fa flowers or give her a gift certificate for massage or maybe do a little extra housework, something that I know has been bothering her, like cleaning the guest bathroom. Just a little something to kind of show, hey, I appreciate this. And I know that you do as well. Yeah, that reminds me. In fact, I actually owe her a little show of appreciation. Okay, cool. So, I need to, <laughs> well, the house is clean, at least the, the downstairs. Back. So, <laughs> yeah, well, on the way back home, I think I'm going to stop and get her some flowers. Oh, nice. quick little public appreciation. We're doing a remodel project in my house, our house, and I spent the day before yesterday tearing the carpet and carpet pad out of one of the larger rooms that will have new flooring put in, and all the. Um, baseboard off the wall all the, all because the... he's doing the work himself in case that wasn't clear yeah 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 saving money <laughs> and it's fun i like it but so i had this big pile of crap in the front yard that needed to go to the dump and the next day as these things will happen i had a bad day in terms of my my grief over my grandmother and i just felt awful yeah. and l while i was taking a nap trying to reset and wake up feeling better loaded that garbage up into the car and took it to the dump for me I should also point out that we were also hosting dinner for 12 that evening, so it really was such an option to leave it on the lawn for another day. It was very, very touching and a wonderful example of a demonstration of love, of taking care of somebody when it's hard to do. And she volunteered, which is nice. Um, it, it is nice when you've done poly for a while or you've been in a relationship for longer that you can sort of anticipate what's going to be tough for your partner and you can volunteer so they don't have to ask, which is really nice in the occasions when you can do that. Yeah. So yeah. shout out to Elle Appreciation. Yeah. But back to our, to our new to poly. Um, you know, new, yes, you get to feel how you feel. You are asking when you should be telling. What I mean by that is you should tell your partner, hey, when you try to cancel our plans without involving me in the reshuffle repeatedly, you're making me feel like you're displacing me, like this new person's more important than me, like you'd rather be with them than with me. Is that how you want to make me feel? Is that the message you want to send? And work with them to see that they're being consistent in what they want and what they do. And that you're getting the message that makes you feel good. And it's totally okay to say, I need these nights. We have this plan. I don't want this to change. And it's also very nice if occasionally, when asked, you can adjust. Or perhaps even volunteer. Or as, even volunteer. As we say. Now, in the part that I didn't read, she did specify. I just want to give her props saying she does plan on addressing this with her partner. That's right. But was emailing us for advice on how she could better respond with her poly issues. So basically, she's she's trying really hard to own her shit. And we want to give you props for that, too. That you're seeing this as not he is making me feel this way, but this is the way that I'm feeling and I own my emotions. So how can I do this? Um so, yeah, I mean, your emotions are always okay to have. Now, this happens to be a situation where I think most people in this situation would probably feel the way that you feel. It's very easy to be displaced when you're constantly asked to accommodate somebody else, but that person never seems to be asked to accommodate your schedule. But that being said, you know, certainly there are people in this situation that would not start to feel that way. I, I say that because I, I just want to give you a little reinforcement that, yeah, what you're feeling is not unusual. It's not due to a lack of poly experience. It's a fairly common feeling. I've certainly felt displaced in the past, uh, not in this relationship, <laughs> but there have been other relationships where it's pretty easy for me to feel displaced. And um, what Lustig I said is exactly right. Um, bring it up with your partner. Own your shit. If there's anything you can do to give your partner advice on how he can help you feel less displaced because, I mean, maybe there just has to be juggling because it's new and, and you know, maybe I, I don't know if the person has an unknown schedule, but if perhaps he could give you more notice, maybe he could ask you instead of tell you. 
And there may be something that the two of you together could figure out that would help you to feel special and help you to feel less displaced. And that's a wonderful experiment to work with him together and say, so what behaviors apart from this could help me? Absolutely. Yeah. Whenever you can, bring a problem to a partner and together craft a solution. Yeah. As opposed to presenting a solution. Yeah. Our first bit of feedback this week is from Andy on our recent STI episode. Hello, Minx. My name is Andy, and I have another time when it might be important for someone to find out if they have HSV that might be shedding but asymptomatic. Uh, That is um, if someone has a female partner who is trying to conceive or is pregnant their partner might want to be tested, and if they have HSV-2 especially, uh, get on uh, immuno, uh, on the suppressive therapy um, to prevent an uninfected partner from getting infected during pregnancy. Um, again, not to uh, make the hype any worse, but uh, just to have a very useful time to know. All right, thanks for all your great work. Bye. Yes, Andy, absolutely. Um, One of my fears with that particular episode was that we would somehow imply that STIs are no big deal, and so therefore you never need to tell anybody if you have an STI, which is not what we wanted to say. We wanted to maybe just take the stigma down a notch or two. But of course, if you do have HSV, HPV, or anything else, of course you should tell your partners. The people who have HSV but who take the suppressive medication transmit the disease 60% less frequently to their partners. So to me, that's a considerate thing that you do. If you know you have HSV, you take that, which means you shed less often, which means it's less likely that you would pass it on to somebody else. And yes, um, it can complicate pregnancy. So that's certainly a valid concern. Absolutely. And I think this is one of the things about Jen's presentation that is so cool In the same way you wouldn't invite somebody to your house without telling them that you had a pet, whatever Mm -hmm. that pet might be, they might be allergic to it. Now, if it's a gerbil, you got a gerbil and you expect that 99% of people are going to be like, yeah, whatever. On the other hand, if it's a badger and you're keeping a badger in your home, people might be like, those are evil. (laughs) A little differently, just, you know, to crib from her scale. But in any case, you always tell people before they come to your house for the first time that you have a pet and what that pet is. Same thing. I like the analogy. Well, it's Jen's. Nice job. Hey, Minx, it's Aggie Says of OffEscalator.com. And uh, I was listening to episode 488 about uh, meeting metamorphs. And uh, I have a a couple of things to add to what you said. First of all, you mentioned to the caller that uh, whatever uh, the caller and their spouse felt comfortable with in terms of um, meeting each other's other partners that that's something the two of them should negotiate. Actually, it's not just the two of them. There are other people involved at that point. And what those other people want, um, or perhaps don't want, counts too. So uh, just wanted to throw in there that there's another uh, viewpoint to consider. And also, um, the the, uh, commenter didn't clarify um, whether their spouse is disclosing right up front that they are non-monogamous and already in an existing relationship. Um, yeah, I'd like to think that that they're uh, disclosing that right up front, but you never know. Um, but that might be a reason for the reticence that she described. Uh, some people like to roll that out later, and uh, it just might be a factor in there. And the third thing is, um, you know, uh, it, speaking of somebody who dates married poly people from time to time, um, it's I have gotten to the point where I prefer to uh, have several dates with uh, with that partner, um, at least to determine how interested the two of us are in engaging any further and what that engagement might look like, whether it's romance, whether it's occasional sex, whether it's just hanging out and having fun. Um, 
I have been in situations where uh, partners wanted me to meet their uh, spouses or other partners right away off the bat before we've even determined what kind of involvement we may want. And it started to feel like an audition, like, hmm, do I pass the family audition? Uh, do I check that box? And do we proceed any further than that? I don't like that. Uh, that doesn't work with how autonomous I like to be in relationships. And um, so that's just another factor to consider. Anyway, thanks a lot. Great episode. Catch you later. Bye. And I apologize that it took me a while to find this audio in my inbox from episode 488. So it's from a while ago. But yes, that was an oversight on my part, that it's not simply up for you and your partner to determine when is the best time to meet the metamor, but the metamor gets to decide as well. Imagine that. I've had this happen as well, where I had one date with somebody, wasn't sure if I liked him, and he's like, okay, meet the wife. And I'm like, well, you know, I, I, you know, I have no objection to that really, but it was like a lot of pressure. I felt like I do feel like I'm being vetted. And I'm like, it's very uncomfortable for me when I don't even know how I feel about that guy yet. Um, and it was fine. You know, it ended up being fine. We ended up just dating a little bit and then not. But um, but yeah, keep in mind that all the adults in the relationship get a say on when and how to meet. Indeed. It's time for your Happy Polly Moment of the Week, brought to you by Fubbly Polyamorists Everywhere. Hi, Minx. This is Diva from Diva and the Dawn, and I'm calling in for my very first Happy Polly Moment. Um, my husband and I have been engaging off and on in Polly for about three or four years now. Presently, we are not engaging in it. However, I decided on a whim yesterday to tell my 13-year-old daughter about what her father and I have been doing for the past few years in regards to Polly um, and kind of gauge how she was feeling about it because I felt like it was something that she needed to know since I, I believe in a completely, totally, 100% honest relationship with my children. So I brought it up slowly, asking about monogamy and how she felt about that, what she thought about that, different forms of relationship structures, and we touched on Polly, and I explained what it was. And then I told her, well, your father and I have been engaging in this for a few years, and not currently um, doing it at the, at the moment, but I wanted her to know, you know, what had been transpiring. And she had questions about it, and, and I asked her, you know, how she would feel if she were to see her or her her father or myself um, engage in a relationship with someone else in physical contact, kissing and whatnot, and she was completely and totally receptive to the idea. She was very open to it. She was just like, you know, I understand that people do things differently than other people. And if that's what their choice and it makes them happy, then I'm all for it. As long as they're not hurting anybody, she was completely and totally game. She understood. She, you know, she asked the questions that she needed to ask. And of course, as expected, you know, she wanted to know how it affected her. And if she didn't like the people that we were dating, would she get to say that she didn't like them and us not be involved and, you know, the typical 13-year-old concerns, but my overall understanding of the situation with her is that she's completely and totally understanding of the situation and how other people feel about things, and she respects that. And I feel like that was an, the best Happy Polly moment I could have ever had because for me, it solidified the fact that I am doing the right thing with my kids and teaching them to be open, loving, accepting, and caring human beings. And I thought that that was something I should share with you. Hope you and Leslie Guy are having an excellent day. And I will listen to the podcast, as I always do religiously. Thank you for all the help and information you've provided with us. Bye. What a wonderful, happy Polly moment of coming out to your kids is Polly. And I love it that, of course, the kid's concerned about you know, what if I don't like somebody you date? You know, what, do I get a bigger room? Do I get a pool? <laughs> well, yeah, absolutely. Get, you know, that's what the kid's worried about. Kids, like all of us, are most interested in how things affect us. Yeah, and it's so true. I tell you that. <laughs> but it is a wonderful little happy Polly moment. And how how nice to hear a positive interactions, uh, interaction between parent and child. Mm, that's indeed. just cool. I am thrilled to welcome our new playmate, Abby, as well as to give a thank you to Leandra for a $69 donation coming out of, from Germany. Ooh, from Germany. So we need to do, so we usually do Canadian 69, 
Maybe we need to do a German 69. German 69? What would German 69 <laughs> I have no idea. We say it with German accents. Maybe maybe, I, maybe we have to stand up, like I have to hold you up off the ground. Something athletic. Something I have no idea. I kind of don't want to stereotype any further than that. Well, I, you know, I've had some amazingly good sex in Germany. Yes, um, that's true. You have. And it, it's, it's a, it, I've actually been pining away for the German FKK clubs in these last few weeks. So Germans, y'all do it right as far as I'm concerned. Those are brothels for those who... Like me, did not know. They can look it up. Google works for everybody. And they are, in fact, some of the best brothels in the world. Ah. <laughs> and on that note, I think we're at least going to open back the windows back up and turn the fans back on and rearrange our ice packs and my naked body. So I will thank you for listening. And uh, thanks to everyone who donated to the show. We are a free resource. We help hundreds of thousands of people navigate their introduction to Polly. Um, if you ever have questions, comments, or feedback, 802-505-POLY. Uh, or you can email polyweekly at gmail.com or find us on Twitter or Facebook. And we are going to send you off with the song Second Favorite Man by Tight Pajamas, which is a collaboration between Jeff Greenwald, an award-winning photojournalist and published author, and Susie Davis, who has performed and recorded with Mick Jagger, Prince, Ben Morrison, Billy Idol, and many other artists. Till next week. Well, I met her at a party near the hot tub and the beer. Our connection sparkled like a crystal chandelier. Her playful smile and bedroom eyes put visions in my head. But then she introduced me to the man who shares her bed well, I hung my head in sorrow, turned away to fill my plate She said, hey baby don't you look so sad, just ask me for a date well, My man and I just don't subscribe to guilt or jealousy so I took her invitation And the rest is history I don't care if my preacher and my friends don't understand well, Sometimes love works better With an extra ampersand Well I know it ain't perfect But I'm taking favorite woman and I'm her second favorite man well, she's my favorite woman and I'm her second favorite man well I won't pretend this kind of love is easy to achieve but I'm crazy about my sharing and I like her Friend Steve, now we don't go for threesomes, though there's nothing wrong with that. But we share our beer and bourbon and one frisky jungle cat. I don't care if my rabbi and my friends don't understand. Sometimes love works better. An extra ampersand well, I know it ain't perfect But I'm taking it in hand Cause she's my favorite woman And I'm her second favorite man She's my favorite woman And I'm her second favorite man
wish with the power of my thighs. <laughs> Your frozen thighs. <laughs>